I passionately put this presentation together. There's only one time that I've sort of uh, presented this in this detail recently, and uh, I, I just want to share this part of the life journey. But uh, there are a lot of things I want to say. I'll say it over the course. But if you look at how I ended up where I am, my research journey started with uh, me graduating from University of Texas at Austin. It's a great school, by the way. And, uh, <laughs> and, and well, then I joined Iowa, and, and then I started working on uh, three research streams based on the data that were available by uh, you know, the, the school as well as Jerry Eskin, who was a co-founder of IRI, Information Resources Inc. And he said that I'll give you all the data if you join us. And I chose that over other competing offers, just purely based on the availability of data. And then after that, I couldn't breathe in Iowa after two years or so or 18 months that because of pollen allergy, I had to go to Houston where they had always kept the offer open for any time I could come back and then started a few other research streams like marketing research uh, applications because I started Center for Marketing Research in Houston and we had a lot of projects that we were working on plus international marketing, marketing strategy at the firm level and then retailing at the market and firm level. So started research in multiple streams to get me motivated all the time and then I moved to Yukon about 15 years ago uh, with ING Center and then started business to business in a big way as well as uh, the marketing strategy at the customer level. And then this customer lifetime value and CRM journey, it's about uh, 2000. But it's, the seeds were planted when I was in Houston, but uh, the takeoff occurred in Connecticut. And then today, if you look at it, at, and after joining Georgia State University, you have three more areas. One is the sales area that you see clearly, salesperson lifetime value. Another one is the Internet of Things, um, which is something I've been telling stories of my watch that I wear and then how I'm connected to everyone. And then engagement, which I think is going to be the new paradigm, new theory, new everything in marketing. And if you look at this journey, what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that this one particular research stream, not all 13, just one, the CRM and CLV phase, where uh, it, it started. You know, before I start this, this particular stream, you all need to know this journey that I started, is it even possible? There was one individual, I think, who made it possible for me, and that individual is sitting in this audience. You should guess who that individual is. It's not my wife. <laughs> it's your Professor Rajan Vardarajan here. He was the one who, before I joined any program here in, in India, I, he came to see uh, his parents, something, then my professor, who is common for both of us in IIT Madras, you know, he said that, uh, you know, my student is here. You can go and ask him for advice if you want to go to the US. I chased him in another city, met him, and asked him for advice. He says, I'm joining Texas A&M. But given your interest, you should join UT Austin. <laughs> you know, uh, but he was so honest and he was so encouraging. He showed me how to go about doing this. And I applied to UT Austin. I got in and the rest became history. He became my mentor, my guru, a well-wisher. And he's been very supportive all along. And it's unimaginable how a person like that could make a, such a big difference in your life. And today I'm really blessed and honored. You're there for me always, even now. He's my boss. Uh, you know, in the boss yeah. Even now he's VP Publications of AMA and I'm the editor of JM, but I report to him and he guides me every step of the way. Thank you so much, and please be there for a long, long time more. Yeah, so don't give up on me. So th this CLV CRM journey started uh, with like Spiegel CEO, uh, me, and I had a doctoral student by name Werner Reinhardt, and he he was a German. So Spiegel is a German company. Ted Spiegel, I think, approached him one time and said, uh, "We have a lot of um, data issues, but you know one thing: we mail a lot of catalogs to customers." 
but only few people buy. And can you help us to identify who may buy? So when the problem came to me from through Werner, and I said, first of all, let's go and ask him to define customer. And that's where our journey started. Till date, this is the first question I ask in my CRM class or any marketing class. Please define a customer. And then everybody would say that, well, I, I bought this bag um, yesterday at, uh, say, some retail store. And am I their customer? And they would say, yeah, you're their customer. No, I just gave the revenue yesterday. Today, I don't, I'm not even part of that list. And I, I, was a, I was a customer. Maybe now I'm a prospect to go back and buy something. But I'm not a customer today. So where it is customer is so distinct in a contractual situation where you have AT&T services, whereas 95% of what we do is non-contractual, like ordering from a catalog. Today I order from a catalog, I get the goods, and then done, I'm using it. Tomorrow I'm not ordering anything, so how can I be your customer? So when we asked that question to Ted Spiegel, he said, my customer is anyone and everyone who bought from me in the past. And that was like, wow, you know, how can that be? That made us think, you know, this customer definition is not probably, it's not deterministic in a non-contractual situation. It is probabilistic. So we need to find what is the probability that they might come back and buy as opposed to saying you're your customers. And we started this journey, then went to Wells Fargo, uh, IBM, Polo Ralph Lauren, ING, so many of them won in a series of uh, implementation and measurement that it, it gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you look at uh, what, what, it, what was the impetus for that, is basically starting with how do we value customers? How do we value customers? And the closest body of knowledge uh, to guide us is how do we value stocks? You know, there, there's a theory, a lot of theories there. So the key thing is how do we value customers? So understand that, let's understand firm valuation first. What determines this? So if you look at corporations make announcements and there are investor emotions playing a role in how they react. So you have, I'm buying this company, like uh, Pfizer saying that I'm going to buy Allergan. $160 billion the announcement. Now it's probably nullified, but they make an announcement, and then the stock price suddenly goes up. And now how is that happening, these announcements? But then also the responses from the stock market also influences, and finally, what is the share price as of that day determines the firm value. And in between, you have the investor emotions that's playing a major role you know, in terms of saying that, you know, I, I don't want to regret, or I want to be aggressive. So all these uh, emotions play in determining this firm value. Okay, this, this is all well understood, but what theory is guided here? If you look at the very first one, it's the net present value theory, present value theory by Fisher. And it, it basically says for investment in any assets, you know, you look for the return at a discounted capital. You know, Fisher's articulation is that, you know, There'll be a stream of cash flows in the future. You'll have to discount it to see what is the return you're getting. Apply that to the firm valuation from an asset to a firm. Then you had the uh, asset pricing theory, and which basically tells us, you know, the Farman and Miller, all of you probably quite familiar with this work, is that again, the firm value is nothing but a discounted future cash flows, uh, discounted for some cost of capital. So what that says is that how do you value a firm? And what do you need to know for that? Projection of cash flows at an aggregate level and a discounted cost of capital. But then once you have the stock, the portfolio theory came about with Markowitz, very famous work. And again, all these I put, they're Nobel Prize winners, you know, most of them are the theory. It says that what do you do to minimize the risk? You have a portfolio of stocks so that you diversify the risk. Very well done. Again, stocks, stocks can be formed into portfolios. And then finally, it says, which portfolio you want to hold? And McFadden came up with this choice theory to say that, you know, what is the advantage, utility of holding one product alternative versus another product alternative? And so you have this work, you know, we have used in marketing extensively. So you have the utility theory. So from valuing the stock to holding a portfolio of stocks to which, what should the portfolio contain, to which portfolio you want to own, 
very well structured. The economic theories, financial valuation theories help. Can they help in valuing customers? That is the key thing. Can they help in valuing customers? So if you look at customer, uh, and so they, they basically gave rise to viewing customers as assets of the firm. So how do customers manifest themselves in, in the business world? There are two ways they manifest. One is, as which I told you, in a contractual setting, that yes, telecom, utilities, loans, where you have certain contract, you have certain terms, you pay, and you get return. And then you have the non-contractual situation. You know, there we would say that in a, in a non-contractual situation, can customers be considered as assets of the firm? Why? Because you don't own them. How can you call an asset, a customer an asset, uh, something that you don't own? If I, if I own this ring, then I say it's an asset, but I don't own anything. But still firms say that I have two million customers. Ralph Lauren would say I have probably like 30 million customers shopping in our store. So the term loosely used, and so we, we need to, to extract a lot more value from them. These are the cases where it's a non-contractual, which basically drives 95% of the revenues of uh, any business from a non-contractual situation. So if this is to be true, then what financial theories guide us? Look at basic, uh, you know, very fundamental market return. You have capital asset pricing model. You have any assets return is a function of risk-free, plus you have the difference from the market, and then some idiosyncratic risk. So I call this as expected return on asset, risk-free, and assets exposure to economy-wide changes, and then you have the error or idiosyncratic risk. But what is the beauty of this is, this is the systematic risk that everybody faces. You cannot diversify this because everybody is subjected to what happens in the market, whereas that's so non-diversifiable. Then this is idiosyncratic risk. Maybe oil industry today is getting beaten badly, so you may want to diversify from this to maybe metals, maybe some other commodities that you can hold, not the oil, or maybe financial services. So this is very well structured. Everybody follows this. Of course, there are um, issues with respect to, you know, what is, is it information asymmetry is there or everybody has perfect information. In fact, we had an engaging conversation this, uh, this morning with the assistant professors in the first meeting about how some of the assumptions that he faced in this paper, the analytical paper, that none of them were, could be found to be true. You know? So, so this, is, this is what it is going on in stock valuation. Now let's contrast this with customer valuation. So remember here, systematic risk is non-diversifiable, unsystematic is diversifiable. So whereas when you value customers, what do you see? You have trying to forecast customer profitability, CP, as a function of what they are buying, how much they bought in the past, all different time periods, and you have their, who they are, age and income, and then the environmental factors, economy and so on. So customer profitability is usually measured or predicted, uh, estimated as a function of past transaction, then who you are, because there is some heterogeneity in your preferences based on who you are, and then what the market economy, ability of the customer to contribute. So if you look at in this position, what is systematic risk? Systematic risks are this. Basically, you know, who you are, how much money you can spend, and this unsystematic. So here it is the opposite. Unsystematic, which is economic conditions or recession affects everybody. So here unsystematic is non-diversifiable, whereas systematic risk is diversifiable. Why? Because systematic risk here, if you have one customer who's buying in some pattern, and this person has a profile that may be a male, 25 to 34 age, and you're marketing to the person that's not contributing much, giving you losses, you can stop marketing to them and go look for a profile that is profitable. So you clearly swap this customer, loss-making customer, with a profit-making customer. So you can clearly find from your database who are the customers with a high profit potential and profile them, go after them. So 
this is the fundamental reason why we say that the stock valuation theory is not readily applicable to customer valuation theory. So you need something unique to, for valuing customers. And therefore, you know, we said that what could be the customer valuation theory and what is in it so that we can somehow integrate the principles from both fields, economics, finance, as, and into marketing. So how do we do this? So first, if you look at financial theories, uh, that they have, this is a comparison that I have drawn between sort of customer valuation theory and financial economic theories. First is they derive value based on stock market responses. Okay. Second, systematic risk, we said I'm just summarizing what we have done. Then we'll take off into the customer valuation. So systematic risk cannot be diversified, whereas unsystematic, which is idiosyncratic risk, can be uh, like oil industry, commodity can be diversified. And emotions play an important role in investment decisions. And then stock returns are impossible to predict in the short run. They call it a random walk, but possible in the long run because there's more stability, economic factors you can bring in into this thing. If you contrast that with sort of valuing customers, what really happens is that they contribute revenue to the firm. They contribute revenue to the firm at different intervals, but they do contribute revenue to the firm, which ultimately determines the firm value. Why? Because every customer's profit, if you add, that's called customer value. When you add it up, it's called customer equity. And then customer equity basically is what is it the future value in today's terms that the firm can generate. And that's basically a substitute for stock valuation. So uh, my daughter works in Wall Street, used to work in Wall Street. And then I brought her one time for this discussion to say that, look, we have done this work using lifetime value, adding it up, customer equity. This is the real value of this company. So if somebody wants to buy this company, this is the price to pay. And, uh, and I said that, for, for example, th so we took an example of that company and valued it. And, but somebody was paying a higher price. I told her, like, that's insane. They shouldn't be paying this much price. And, um, but she said that what they are paying is insanity. What you are doing is also insanity because you don't need any theory for valuation, you don't need anything. It boils down to, she has been a broker from the buyer and the seller, he says what, it boils down to some simple thing. How much money you, have, you can afford to buy this company, that's it. That's all it matters to. Ability and willingness to buy from this. So all these theories, how much ever you give it to us, we are not going to use it in Wall Street because that's not the way it works. So I felt very dejected hearing that. That too, she came to one of our major conferences, AMA conferences, and spoke in a special session. And I said, I'm not going to give up on this. Let me go and talk to the economist and the, the real Wall Street people, you know, so although she was working there. But clearly, we are saying that customer valuation is, is free of any emotional attachment because we actually model their contributions. 15 years ago, if somebody had told me can you really predict customers' purchases over the next, say, three years? In, so how many times they'll go to, say, Ralph Lauren and keep buying? I would have said, I have no idea. But today we can say with 85% accuracy, we can predict how many times they'll go, how much money they'll give. And we can also say how much marketing you have to do, optimal marketing you have to do. So that is the science that we have developed. So customer value can be predicted in the short term, but not in the long term. It's the opposite of the stock return. Why? Because what we call a short term is three year period. Beyond the three year period, whatever forecast you make about customer purchases, when you discount it by 12 or 15 percent, it's heavily discounted your fourth year, fifth year, sixth year contributions. It doesn't add much. One reason. Second reason, companies change their product composition. They introduce new products, new services. So anything that you project too much into the future will be error prone because it cannot be accurate. And the third reason is that there is a lifestyle change in the customer itself. They can get married, they can graduate, they can go. So therefore, again, here also we see it is the opposite. What you cannot do in the short run with stocks, you can do that with the customer valuation. Of course, your short run here, you're talking about maybe days, weeks or something. Here we are talking about one year, two years, three years, based on the businesses. If you're, if you're a grocery store business, we can do it on a weekly basis. If you're doing uh, Ralph Lauren retail apparel, you can do it maybe on a, 
monthly basis. If you're IBM, you can do it on a yearly basis. If you're banks, you can do it on a quarterly basis. So we have set terms for where you can have the maximum predictive accuracy. So, so this is now where our contribution comes, introducing, introducing this customer valuation theory. What is it? Again, we say that this, this is a lot of components here, so I'll break this down. It's nothing but a mechanism. I want to say it's a mechanism to measure the future value of a customer you know, as, as a component, like there is a way to measure the direct contribution. Then there is a depth of the contribution. So the direct contribution is their profit. So how much profit a customer gives? Debt, and what other ways the customer can give profits? Breadth. So we'll deep dive into each one of these components by accounting for the systematic risk with volatility and vulnerability, both we account for, in, and exploiting the unsystematic risk, which is the overall customer contribution potential. So we bring in this economic theory comparison by saying which is systematic risk, which is unsystematic, what is diversifiable, and, and, and a simple example is that you have 1,000 customers today. Some of them are giving losses. So I don't want to market to them, throw them out, I'm going to retain them. Then if you say that I'm going to get somebody else, then tomorrow, again, these customers are giving losses, I'm going to throw them out, and I'm going to get whoever I threw out yesterday, I'm going to get back. You can't do that in, with the customers. Whereas stock, you can do that. Today, I'm selling Michelle stock today. And then tomorrow, suddenly, uh, Saudi Arabia says we are going to freeze the oil output. The market goes up. I can again buy the Shell stock. You cannot do that with customers. A lot of restrictions. So this theory is able to guide us in terms of this valuation of this customer. So using customer valuation theory to improve the firm value. So my, the way I focus my research is, it's focusing on three aspects of it. First is how to value the customers as assets. Second, once you have this customer, what should be the portfolio of customers that you should hold? And the third is the most important thing. Since you cannot fire and then rehire customers, you need to nurture this customer, nurturing profitable customers. That's very critical how you focus. So let's go into each one of these components, which is valuing customers. So I created this matrix, which is on one side, you have this theory, the theoretical components, which is the direct economic contribution, the depth, and the breadth. The other side is what we need to do to measure. Using this theory, what are we measuring? And what, is, what are the tools we need? What are the strategic elements we need to make this happen. So it's not a one way to look at this theory. You need to look at how this theory applies in each of these principles. Like I want to first value. These are the jobs I need to get done. And so how do I do this? So first is this valuation of customers as assets is the customer lifetime value, the direct economic contribution. Then here I want to create this portfolio of customers. And then how do I nurture? The traditional theories said that you need to build loyalty among your customers. So we came and changed the principle saying that if you build loyalty first, there's no guarantee you're going to find profitability. So find profitable customers and then build loyalty with them. So that's what we call it as profitable loyalty, as the way to nurture them. So this is the first element that we did. Then in terms of how to increase the depth of this contribution, meaning is CLB a number? Your potential profitability for the next three years is $800. Is that all? Are you going to walk away with, okay, this is the 800. Can you make 800 as 1600, 2400? So here is where we measure the augmented customer value. And I'll give you examples of that. What, what is an example? Many examples of augmented customer value. And then once you augment it, then find the segments. So your portfolio, you can have now multiple segments. One is a growing segment in value, another is stable segment in value, another is declining segment. And some may be in the base value, they are higher, and the augmented value, they are lower. So you have a lot of options now coming in. Here is where options theory come in very handy from finance. Now, who you want to bet on. And then what is going to facilitate this uh, augmentation is the interaction orientation, which we advocated at that time was the next generation after market orientation. And then the third is that 
Now, can customers contribute beyond their own pocket? Yes, they can be highly influential in making uh, indirect economic contribution by encouraging their friends, family, relatives, everybody to go and buy from the company. There are three other ways they can significantly influence. And I will share with you what are those three ways. And then what are the, what are the metrics to measure that? Here are the metrics that I will show you. And then what can facilitate that happening? That is the engagement strategy, which we are just in a verge of releasing the strategy. And the next 10 years, you're going to see a lot more about this engagement. So if you look at the evolution of managing customers, there's a beautiful story to be told. First is we focus on the transaction of the customers in the 90s. Then in the 2000s, we said transaction is not enough. We need relationships. Then now in the 2010s, this decade, we are talking about relationship is just one dimension. We need engagement. You know, we need to engage them in multiple ways. So transaction to relationship to engagement is the evolution in managing customers that you see. So let's take one by one, this valuing customers. So I'm going to go like this, valuing customers as assets. So first, we will measure the CLV. What, what, how do we go about measuring the CLV? And what are the ways to maximize the CLV? And what are the ways these customers can contribute? So first, measuring this contribution. Here, we are saying at the customer level, the net present value of the future profit in today's value. That's also where I've already said net present value of the future transactions. You know, so any profit, you need three elements for that. And it's so nice because of our behavior. We all say we have chaos in the way we go and buy or something, but you can find order, pattern in all this chaotic behavior. And we were able to capture that. And this, this interest in capturing this pattern in chaos occurred to me 25 years ago in 1990 when, when I worked with the US Department of uh, Defense, like uh, John Salmon, who was working there and in a, in a casual exchange with him, uh, is saying that you do this patent recognition for military. And I have developed this patent recognition in product positioning and in, in customer buying behavior. So, but I see they say it's order. Like, in other words, in marketing, there are statistics, there's zero order process. They would say that. You cannot predict it's all random. So, can we, I find a pattern even in when they say it's, it's like not possible to predict. And I developed this tool, like applied this, and uh, he said, well, it, you can publish it. I don't want to be part of it because of my restrictions, but you can acknowledge my, con my support, my, thing that I, you interacted with me. So I put a footnote in that article, it's called nonlinear mapping. So I, I basically applied that kind of knowledge again here to see that they may be buying every two months, they may be buying at every two months, eight months, again four months, another five months. When you look at it, it's chaotic. But how do I explain that behavior? Why two, four, eight, five? Then I, I see that the variables that I put in into the model to explain suddenly brings the order into this thing. That's where what kind of variables you choose to predict this. So it aids in understanding the quality of the length of stay of a customer, meaning we introduce this first time a term called profitable lifetime duration. How long a customer will stay profitable for me? You know, that's a profitable lifetime duration. And then when you all discount it to the future present value, then it became customer lifetime value. So once we measured the value, this we call it as a wheel of fortune strategy. Second is to maximize this one number, $800 into 1,600, 2,400. We found 16 ways for companies to maximize this. So each of these wheel is a uh, paper published, is an implementation in a real world, in a real company multiple times, and all generating positive cash contribution. There's not a bankruptcy wheel in anywhere here. Everything is profitable contribution. So this is what we did over like a 10 year period, 2000 to 2011 or so uh, in terms of, and, and it was never thought of as a wheel of fortune when we began, when, only after like 10 years of working, they said, so you have so many strategies, which one is better than that made us think through, you know, how to put this structure together. So these are the ways to actually deepen the economic value contribution, the depth. So this is exactly customer's own contribution. But then how do you extract value from 
outside of this. Again, we said that if you have a customer and you know the customer's behavior both in the online and offline world, and then you also monitor the firm and competitive actions, you have the customer brand value, what they think of the brand, a Texas A&M brand, and then they come to school here and they give you their money through education, through alumni, they continue to support you. And then they tell their friends and family saying that you should go to Texas A&M. They write about Texas A&M in the social media, Facebook and everywhere saying that what a great experience that they had. And then they call the school and say like, you know, I had to go through this when I went to the program. You can actually do much more uh, improvements to either the physical facilities or to the course structure or the timing or the classroom facilities. Any of those, they can give you ideas that you can implement it. So what we call this as the indirect contribution, which see our customer referral value and customer influence value and knowledge value. So we show here how to monetize a like. So in, in other words, if you take one example of this research, if somebody says, I like Texas A&M in the Facebook, what is the value of that? What is a, in, in a business world, if somebody says, I like Ralph Lauren, we'll say, what is the monetary value? But in a Texas A&M case, what is the value of Facebook? Like how many people are enrolling? You know, how many people you're bringing because of that? We can attribute to, the, to that effect. What is the monetary value of uh, somebody saying like or share or a tweet? So we were able to create that uh, science behind this. So all these are metrics and they lead to what we call it as the overall engagement. So if you ask, is there a single company today that is exactly um, exploiting values in all these four dimensions? Not a single company today. <coughs> There's not a single company. Somebody, some people are doing extremely well in this. Financial services are doing well in this. Uh, some of the digital companies are doing well in this. Small business retailers are doing well with social media. And in terms of uh, CKV, Dell has got the idea storm. Best Buy has got the blue label strategy. So on Microsoft and IBM, they have their, like, their customers writing the software for, with the open source system in R. So they all have mechanisms set up, but is there one company doing all of this? Not yet. This is the future that you see in terms of how a customer as a holistic can be used. And again, all these are documented well. So if you look at how, why companies are paying so much attention and showing so much interest is, this is what they thought a customer's potential is. But once we show this capability, then this has become the, uh, the capacity that the, each customer's contribution can be much higher than what the company initially thought of, and then it can be extended for a long period of time by coming up with the right kind of acquired customers and retaining the right customers and not letting go. Or even if somebody leaves, you win them back, the lost customers, which is one of our recent research, win back lost customers. So these are the engagement strategies that we have put in place and show what should be the optimal resource allocation. So once you value the customer, what kind of customers you want to hold on to? Here is the customer portfolios. Again, we say in terms of direct depth and the breadth. So what is the portfolio of customers that you want to go? So you need to measure something to hold a portfolio. So that's where you come up with this. Here again, I want to contrast with this one slide, contrast with economic theories here. See, extended con extend the concept from the portfolio theory, which basically advises a fund manager to eliminate the unique risk by diversifying, okay? So having a well-diversified portfolio. Can you do that here with the customer base? This is not possible or even practical with the customer portfolio because of sh shifting back and forth with one customer and another one, and that's not possible. So what do you have to do? If you look at the financial portfolios, they are typically classified. Anytime you go and say, I want Fidelity Magellan Fund, what is the standard thing you get? In the last five years, this has returned 21% with beta of whatever number, 0.8 or something. So they look at the history. But customer assets are not classified on a historic return, but it's completely based on measurement of future. Who is likely to really give me, we actually put a model, measure the future, we know it's at least 85% accurate, 
in terms of the prediction behavior. So that's the way the valuation occurs. Second, finance, finance managers typically invest in individual assets to maximize the portfolio's return. Whereas in the customer case, each customer we invest and we maximize the return from each customer. So very different again. So here is where we find the CLV metric to be a great metric for predicting the future and optimal marketing investments came about because of this. How do you really find how much to invest in a customer? Never thought of, because the salespeople would say that, you know, if you tell the salespeople, don't go and knock the door again and again. Oh, I have no issues reaching out to them because I want their business. And so here is where it was tough to tell salespeople to stop touching at the optimal level so that you can make the most money for your company. So once you measure this, so now what do you do to find the segments of customers? So here is where you need to have this augmented value. That is what do you see here is the baseline is what typically they are buying and if they buy this in the future, how much profits they'll give. What is augmented doing is that if you take any strategy from the Wheel of Fortune strategy or all of it, how much more you can extract. And that is the augmented CLV. And look, for every customer, $14 goes up. And if you have 20 million customers, you can really have a lot more value of that. So this is based on 12 month prediction from an actual implementation. So the augmented is baseline CLV which is the original direct economic contribution plus the impact of the Wheel of Fortune strategies. Time and again we have done this over and over across culture so there's not an issue. And then our metrics basically to measure the indirect value contribution. So you have the CLV, then you have the engagement, the CRV, CIV, but these are 10 other metrics that we have developed using CLV as the core. And one example of salesperson lifetime value is that here is a company that, had, that, that has 120,000 salespeople. And each one of them, the salespeople have their own territory. What territory means? They have a certain number of customers. How they allocate the territory? Based on equal opportunity. Meaning each territory is worth generating $20 million of revenue for them or profit from them, any metric you use. And it comes from maybe 100 customers or 50 customers, but the territory is balanced and the salesperson. So we measured this for this company, the customer lifetime value, everything is fine, allocated the territories. A year later, the salesperson didn't realize, not all of them, everybody should have realized that because these customers showed the potential to give, but some salespeople generated that, some people couldn't. Why? And that gave rise to, because what is salesperson lifetime value is, if I am the salesperson, you are my customers, some of your lifetime value in principle is my lifetime value. Subtract my commission and my training and everything. There are a few nuances, but this is what it is. So, and we take this and then donor lifetime value. You go to a university, you go to the alumni, you go to the foundation, ask them to give the database of all the alumni who are given money in the last so many years. We fit a model, we tell them these are the donors, you should go and knock the doors, you will get much more money this year. Two universities implemented our model. One was Yukon, another was Tennessee. And, and they did it. They made more money, so donor lifetime value. So every one of this, you can clearly see the metrics. So by this time you know that I focus on metrics so that there is a tangible outcome. And then you invest in that metric to maximize it, put a strategy behind it, and then company basically realizes a lot of money. So if you look at nurturing profitable customers, now, you got the customer measured, then you are now putting a portfolio. Now you want to grow them because you got to hold on to these customers. Even if somebody is giving you low profits or losses, you need to find a way to improve this. How do you do this? So here is where, in terms of nurturing, to maximize CLV, you want to hold on to the customer for a long time. And here we give a segmentation strategy of, here is some of the customers who have been with you for very little time, some for long time. So duration is one of the loyalty metric. And here is a high profit, low profit. And we want, every company wants their customers to be true friends. Meaning, you've been buying from me for a long time and giving me higher profit. But you see barnacles. 
this is where companies lose their money. They say, oh, he's my loyal customer. She's my loyal customer. I'm investing. But they never contribute to the profitability. The butterflies, companies ignore them. They have been with me just two, three years. They're giving me a lot of money. But how do I know they will stick with me? So we give them a magic formula, which is which butterflies will become true friends in due course of time, and which one will become barnacles. We gave them eight drivers to identify which butterflies. Till date, over 100 companies have implemented it. The study was published in 2003, and then last year it won the Shet Foundation and JM for the longest impact, those eight drivers, repeatedly cited and used by companies, and also won the Paul Root Award that time. So every one of this, so the moment in our discipline we find that eight drivers, they can find true friends, no company lost money investing in butterflies to go after the true friends. So this is the way that we manage. We get the lifetime value of a customer and hold on to that for a long time using the segmentation that you really want to focus. These strangers, they don't stick with you. They don't give you a profit. Don't invest in them. So here is where, uh, you know, in, in one of the bookbinders club, like similar to that Amazon, one company asked us, if somebody is there, is the first purchase value predictive of lifetime value? Just the first purchase. Just if you have an interaction here, how many of you just raise hands thinking in buying books? How many of you think first purchase is an indicator of future value? In other words, higher the first purchase value, higher the future value. How many of you think there is a positive relationship? Okay, many hands go up. How many of you think it's a negative relationship? How many of you think there's no relationship? Okay, that's equal number of hands going up for no relationship. So we, uh, the company gave us like six years of this customer data. So we take year zero and then first purchase. F greater than $50 in spending and buying books, less than $50. Then we track their behavior over the next five years, how much contribution they made. And we find, lo and behold, that higher the first purchase value, higher the customer lifetime value. What is the implication of this? Because this company, which is, I can't name it, but I can say like Amazon, they said that based on that, we want to give free shipping. But we want to do that free shipping at this dichotomy only if we know their lifetime value is going to be higher. And then they implemented this free shipping policy for that value after that. So, Clearly, you will see that how this, the structure really helps. Then to put this, to extract this augmented value, you need something, interaction orientation. There was market orientation which focused at the aggregate level, but interaction orientation came in, in our field in marketing as, as and it's, it's got a blend of both information systems as well as marketing. With nothing but customer is the key concept, and everything starts with the customer. And then you need to create an uh, IT system where you can correspond with the customer in real time. And then it says you need to empower the customer. This is the biggest thing in this interaction orientation. That let customers decide if it, if it is choosing seats in the airplane, if it is deciding to uh, book a rental car, which car they want to choose to the, when they go to the parking lot. Every, let the customer be empowered. And then finally, you have this most customer value management is that we value customers with how much customer value management focuses on segmenting, measuring everything based on customer lifetime value as the metric. So these four things we put together, implemented in organizations, and our Marketing Science Institute completely funded this study and reached out to their membership base and, and measured this for us to show that yes, which companies are highly interaction oriented, they are able to deliver better performance because of the focus on value management. So this leads to the final thing, which is the, not the last part of the presentation, but the, in this storyline, which is the customer engagement strategy. So if you look at who all benefited from that, can I go out and boldly say, these are the companies out of 150 companies, maybe I can say some of them because these are all also published studies. IBM openly declared like we made over $20 million in this. Hokey Pokey is a small business retailer declared uh, saying that uh, they multiple benefits. Brand awareness went up, ROI went up, sales growth went up, everything. Georgia Aquarium, which is a great story. Last year it was released. Uh, like there are 20 aquariums in this country. 19 
20 of them, okay? One is Georgia Aquarium, other than that, 19. All of them were going down for the last five years in attendance and revenue. So Georgia Aquarium uh, has a great board, which is the CEOs of all the Atlanta companies, the Fortune 500 companies, including our president, Becker, Georgia State. Uh, so he is also a board member. So when Bernie Marcus, who is the co-founder of Home Depot, said that this is not acceptable, somebody has to do something to reverse this decline, and Mark Becker raised his hand and said, no, talk to our Center for Excellence in Brand and Customer Management. And so the CEO and the CMO of Georgia Aquarium came to us, spoke to us. We created five marketing science models behind that, put a strategy in place. One year later, when it was implemented, you saw the thing going up by 10% and 12%. So only aquarium in the country, the reverse. So what was done, basically we measured the customer lifetime value of the pass holders and, and the visitors as two segments. Then we said, what should we do? What are the drivers that make them keep coming back again? Find the drivers. And where do we find more people like this? So we had the heat map from the zip codes. They came, the high value customers, and found out in and around Atlanta, where which other zip codes have similar heat map, then we'll go and target them. How do we target them? We had the split cable television advertising. So into the cable television, we had Georgia Aquarium ads to those specific households which has the profile. Suddenly this reverse, and then they're in the only one reversing and going higher and higher. So we can apply this valuation theory and, and how to maximize this augmented value. And then Ralph Lauren is another one that said 42% increase in same store revenue for the bottom line stores. So there's just few examples that I could directly share with you. Many more of that. So our implementation of customer valuation theory across how many industries? And you can see insurance, catalog, mailing, high-tech airlines, internet, retail, newspapers, automobile. So can somebody now say, you've done everything? Have you implemented like in all aspects? I would like to say yes at this point, but filling the gap in applying. There are two distinct cases here from this slide. One could find a big hole. One could say that, where is the consumer packaged goods industry here? Because that is a leading industry. Have you, is, it, does, is your theory applicable there? And second thing is, you have done all this for maybe one country, single country, like US or Europe or Germany or, you know. How about multiple countries? Here is a multinational retailer, Ralph Lauren, take. And they operate in over 30 countries. So when you do this, or these theories, like whatever principles you have, can it be applied across? So we took this as a challenge, and then we want to fill this gap. So the first one is in a global context. We just got published, this one with my doctoral student, which is we took this multinational apparel retailer, 30 countries data, and we had customers, 1,000 customers, transaction data from each of those 30 countries. And then we say that let's apply these principles and see does it work. Why do we need, first of all, a global customer lifetime value concept? Because if you look at how companies market, you know, people say that, well, culture makes a big difference. You know, one of the things that we are encouraged is that if you develop a theory, make sure it's applicable across all. And so studying the role of national culture in marketing teaches us the many ways <laughs> these theories, which, which we call it as uh, paradigms also. I know Rajan has reservations about paradigms, but are reflections of the culture in which they are developed. You know, so, so clearly, um, it's a nice word you know, to use. So, so let's look at how companies practice here. It's important to understand before the national culture is so important. Disney, they really look at this, this campaign, happiest place on earth. Any country they go, France or uh, Netherlands or China, Cuba, anywhere they go, they look at what the locals want, clearly the local cultural elements. On the other hand, look at here, C and A, in Europe, standardized buying in 1997. By 2000, they closed all the stores because one thing fundamental, British and Irish, Irish consumers differed from the, of the continental Europeans. We all know, although Europe is European Union, they're all very different culturally, but then how can you do this? So we need to take the buying. Simple thing is, you can say that if somebody comes every three weeks or maybe two, three, four weeks 
intervals to buy. We put some variables to predict in the US context. The same variables won't work if in India or China that you're trying to do. Answer is why. So let's look at the fundamental model that our, our CLV model. What, what have we learned so far is that past transaction behavior and then past marketing efforts, they both dictate at what intervals the customers will come and buy and how much money will they give. And then how much marketing the company has to do today to realize this is also a function of how much money the customer has given in the past. So this is about the customer side, how often they'll come and how much money they'll give. This is on the firm side, how much they should spend is dictated by the customer's past behavior. They go into the lifetime value. Now in a cross-cultural case, suddenly you see the cultural factors come and moderate. Meaning like, higher the cross-buy, higher the purchase frequency. Meaning if somebody buys in multiple categories, menswear, women's wear, children's wear, jewelry, fashion, luggage, then higher will be the purchase frequency okay, in the US. But can that be said of China? Can that be said of India? So that's where these cultural factors come and moderate this and show us you know, what it does. And the economic factors directly impact the frequency and margin. So we bring this theory, there are a lot of theoretical discussion there. And then we find that, I'm just giving you the result here. So it shows that if somebody is shopping in multiple channels, they're buying from you in the store, they're buying from you in the outlet store, they're buying from you on the website, they're buying from you over the phone or catalog. So multiple channels they're buying, higher will be the customer lifetime value. But in a country which is high on individualism, the effect of this positive, this effect, this uh, multi-channel, higher the multi-channel, higher the CLV, that effect will be enhanced even further in individualistic countries. We say high. And that effect will be lowered if, you, if a country has got a long-term orientation. So we advance why. We argue for using multiple theories and show, argue, and we show this result, this is the finding. So how will a company now, if you are a Polo Ralph Lauren, when you're marketing to multiple countries, what should you really do? This gives them the template of what to expect. You know, if they do multi-channel, if that country is high on individualism, then it's going to elevate the effect. But if the same country is high on LTO, that's going to lower. So we need to find what is the net net effect. In the end, taking into account all the country characteristics, what is going to be the ultimate benefit. So this is what we did, and the multinational thing, and it just came out. And then now CPG industry, which one of my doctoral student, uh, Saran, is forthcoming in JMR, in, in hopefully this year sometime. And here also, in the CP, this is the only industry left. And so we said, okay, how does it work? Why did it take this long to implement in this? because this industry is really, really complicated. Why? Look at first, here is somebody going to the grocery store and they want to buy Coke, they're looking at Coke, but they're also looking at Pepsi and Dr. Pepper. And what happens next? So you have all these, you know, I call it X, some number. First challenge here is that they could just buy one or all of it. That's multiple discreteness. In layman's term, all that means is they could buy one of them or multiple of them. Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper to satisfy the heterogeneity in the house. Second, they can also buy in differing quantities of each of those. So that is the challenge. Challenge two is heavy brand switching. One time they might buy Coke because it was on sale. Next week they buy Pepsi because that's on sale. We know that six pack 99 cents promotion, they kept switching back and forth. That's the second. The third is the customer has some budgetary constraint. Clearly they feel that how much money I could spend each week on this item, there's a budgetary constraint. The fourth one, which is the biggest challenge, is putting all of them together in one study, which is accounting for all these multiple decisions, jointly estimating, there's nothing that exists out there. We need to come up with a new modeling framework. It took two years for my doctoral student to work with us, and the study was commissioned by a, a parallel body to FASB, which is MASB, Marketing Accountability Standards Board. They said that you know all these things are done, but P&G and Kimberly Clark, they all want you to measure CLV in a CPG context. Give us the data. AC Nielsen 
worked with them, gave us the data on including competition. This is the first data set to have a customer buying Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper, buying all com competitive products to really look at it. And we had to overcome the challenge, each of this, with some statistical wizardry. But accounting for all of this, this study, this slide is basically saying that these challenges were overcome. And what is the result? So tell me, who has the highest CLV customer? Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper? How many of you say Coke? How many of you say Pepsi? CLV, highest CLV. Pe Dr. Pepper. Oh my God, no Mark. <laughs> you have seen this. Look at high CLV. Who has the highest proportion of high CLV customers? No, first is a distribution, like sorry. Next slide has got that. This is a distribution, like any other distribution, exponentially decreasing. There is basically top 20% of the customers giving you most of the profits. Rest all are little, little. So this is the way we segment. But the key question is, who are these high CLV customers? Are they Dr. Pepper customers or Coke or, or um, Pepsi? See, Coca-Cola has got 32% of the high CLV customers. Dr. Pepper has got 19%. Pepsi has got 41%. So when we presented this to Coke, we thought they would throw us out. <laughs> but they said, we know this. I mean, we, when they say we know this, they don't know the exact measurement. They know that our customers buy our Coke. We have more customers buying. We have larger market share. But in terms of consumption and profitability, Pepsi has got the diehard loyal customers. Maybe all of them come from India because they're highly loyal there you know, in, in terms of Pepsi because of what it is. If you look at the medium CLV, Coke has got the largest medium CLV. And, and then in terms of low CLV, you have, again, uh, Pepsi is there, Dr. Pepper, 25%. Uh, obviously, if they are low here, they'll have to go higher. So this is something was revealing but had face validity, and so it was awesome. The next question is, how do I change this, Coke has? So let's assume that if the budget goes up for every household by 10% or 20%, how will this change? If they have more money, will they buy more of Coke than Pepsi? So we looked at the change in CLV for the budgetary constraint, which is if the budget goes up, this 20%, what happens? If the budget goes up by 20%, the high CLV will go up by 0.8%, close to 0.8%. But if the budget goes down, suddenly they feel recession, they don't have enough money, they will penalize buying CPG much more than if they have money that they will reward you more. So this is, this is again, second phase validity, they said, is during recessionary times, the first thing that household cut out from the budget was drinking soft drinks. So that's why Coke now is heavily into diversifying into juices, vitamin drinks, and water, branding so much. And in fact, the most recent reports also show that how much, uh, how hard are they have been hit. So when both, so, so this is the story that we have shown is how to engage customers. So when you engage customers, you can get this direct contribution and indirect contribution in, in a much bigger way. And now with this, both global and CPG industries, all of them have been measured to showcase what it is. But can still companies extract more value for what they offer beyond customer engagement? And this is where one of my doctoral students who joined the program, Anita Pansari, she had done already some work on employee engagement. And, and so she brought in that talent to us. And then we put her employee engagement and what we had done as customer engagement in a single study, went to 120 firms, measured this, and said that, okay, if you have employee and customer engagement, and you empower the employees to help the customers, to engage the customers, what is the benefit? And we clearly showed that firm performance really goes up. We had two time points in measurement, year one and year two. We showed that as companies put processes in place to engage their employees more and their customers engage more, firm performance goes higher. But this effect, is higher in B2B firms, in service firms, and when employees are empowered, the moderators. So now this gave uh, the firms additional 
force, additional strategic elements that customers engaging, okay, I understand, employees to be engaged, and okay, here is actual evidence. This is also forthcoming now in JMR, so, uh, but I can share the study with you. Clearly shows that employees have to be engaged. Individually, Gallup poll and others, Wall Street Journal have written uh, that employees should be engaged, like Southwest Airlines has the highest retention of employees because of this, this. They engage their employees better. Dell does it better. American Express does it better. But here you have the actual evidence. Then, uh, so the question is, is it enough for a firm to engage just the customers and the employees? Is it just enough? The answer is probably not. And so here is where uh, one of uh, the same doctoral student, Anita Pansari, she's working on additional research to say that I'm going to create. So, so what we have seen so far is if firms have the focus, strategic focus of engaging customers and engaging employees, they benefit. But how can they implement that? What do they need to implement a customer engagement strategy, an employee engagement strategy? They need something called engagement orientation. This is what we call new thing. That's why I said the future is gone from market orientation to interaction orientation to engagement orientation, where we, we need to engage investors, employees, suppliers, distributors, customers, and community. And what they do is when you engage all of them, when you put an orientation, when you put a process in place, it gives you efficiencies. What kind of efficiencies? First of all, it gives you technical efficiency, then marketing efficiency, then cost profit efficiency. What this says is that if I create a mechanism, I put like for engaging customers, what do I have to do as a process? First of all, I need to have a measurement. And then I need to evaluate managers as a function of this. So, so clearly, we describe for each one of this what should be the one, and then you have higher firm performance controlling for this. This is current working paper, but this is, this is really you see as the future that you just don't stop with one element of engaging, go to employees and then go to other stakeholders. And already in marketing, some researchers like Thomas Hult, they have articulated that you need to engage multiple stakeholders and we are just implementing that in the sense that these are the stakeholders. This is what is the, the big picture that you will see. So if a company does all these things, what will they get? We see multiple benefits of implementing this customer valuation theory. It not only helps the firms, but it also helps customers, the society, the environment, and finally the employees in multiple ways in terms of eliminating resources, in terms of nurturing the customers, in terms of uh, managing the well-being of employees. As part of this employee engagement, now we are given this watch to all many companies' employees. Wear this watch so we monitor your sleep pattern. If an employee is not sleeping well and we see a bad habit, the, the HR department goes and talks to the employees and says, like, you need to really sleep well. You know, your pattern shows that you're not taking care of your health. Proactively, we go and take care how pleased the employees are. So we have a field study that is going on in over 23 countries for a company, their employees, big time, in 23 countries simultaneously right now. And that is, that is what is the next wave as to how to connect this Internet of Things, which is the latest research, to manage each of this. We give this to the customers also, of insurance company customers, where they will wear this watch, and then if they have 90 days of good behavior, they'll get 5% discount on their insurance premium. 180 days of good behavior, 10%. What is a good behavior? They need to take 10,000 steps a day, burn 3,000 calories, sleep seven to nine hours in that range, so we define what is a good behavior based on the medical diagnosis. We don't do that. The medical industry defines that. So, so this, this, this basic, um, this is the story that I wanted to say. You know, so, thank you for listening to this. Uh,